This Week in Startups is brought to you by NetSuite by Oracle, the business management software that handles every aspect of your business in an easy-to-use cloud platform. Get NetSuite's free guide, Seven Key Strategies to Grow Your Profits, when you go to netsuite.com slash twist. The Meeting Owl Pro by Owl Labs, a 360-degree smart video conferencing camera that's revolutionizing how companies collaborate. To get $50 off your first Meeting Owl, visit owllabs.com slash twist, then use offer code twist at checkout. And Brex, the corporate credit card built for startups with no personal liability, up to 20 times higher card limits, and huge rewards, Brex is perfect for venture-backed startups. Sign up at brex.com slash twist and get card fees waived for life by entering the code twist during sign-up. Upcoming launch events. Apply for the next Launch Accelerator cohort. Applications are due Friday, December 13th. Learn more and apply at launchaccelerator.co. Hey everybody, welcome to This Week in Startups. I'm your host, Jason Calacanis, and this is the show where we interview founders about their startups and how they want to change the world. And there are two lies, two, one, two lies that they have been telling in Silicon Valley for the last decade. One is you cannot compete against Facebook, and two, people will not pay for a social network. These two things have been proven false by my next guest, who has one of the hottest social photography community apps in the world today. That app is called Visco. And it's spelt like disco, but with a V and no I, V-S-C-O. You can go to vsco.com, or you can search for VSCO in your app store and download it right now and find out what all the buzz is about. Uh, and that founder is Joel Flory. Welcome to the pod. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's uh, becoming a bit of a phenomenon. I Somebody was like, oh, yeah, that girl's just a Visco girl. Yeah. And I don't think this was meant in a derogatory way. This was meant in a complimentary way. What is what does Visco mean? What does Visco Girl mean? Yeah. So Visco, it's a mobile app. Okay. Helps you take professional quality photos from your mobile phone. Um, really kind of bringing creativity in a more accessible format. And then really built with this community around self-expression. So less about how you want the world to see you, more about how you see the world. Got it. So it's less about selfies and more about photography. Um, or it, beauty? It, think think of the lens of a yes and, um, because a selfie could still be about how you see the world. You could still uh -huh. be expressive um, with taking a, a photo of yourself. But it is more around turning that camera around and capturing what you see around you. Got it. Yeah. And how is it different? And I'm, I'm sure this is an annoying question, but how is it different than the market leader, Instagram, or the other market web-based leader, Pinterest? Because yeah. those are the two juggernauts yeah. in photography, correct? They're they're both both very large. Yep. Yeah. So for Visco, it's never been an either or. Um, it's more about when you take a look specifically, even with Gen Z, who makes up over seventy five percent of those that use our app. Okay, so those are people under, under the, the age, age of twenty five. Yeah, yeah. Um, they have this social playbook. They know what they're going to use an app for. It's not this one size fits all. You know, they know the platform they want to use for one-to-one -one messaging. They know one-to-many. And for Visco, it's really that lens of, it's not about aspirationally how I hope people see me. So it's not my personal portfolio or brand. Mm. Um, there's not this compare culture with it. Visco is really, you do it for yourself. You mm. share photos because it feels good. Um, so it's the beauty of the photography. It's the moment you captured, maybe some pride in work, but less about FOMO, less about, you know, showing off maybe. Uh, almost entirely not about FOMO. So like when we talk, we talked to our consumers recently in a recent survey and over 87% were talking about how on Visco, they don't feel pressure to be compared to someone else. There are there never have been public likes or comments. It's never been, or follower counts. You can't see how many people ah. someone has as a follower. It's about you. Are you sharing because you want to? So you stripped out the devices that were meant to addict people. Yeah, we architected it from the beginning. So it wasn't even like okay, we you didn't had strip it. Them out. You decided yeah, never exactly. to put in the viral loops and the addictive nature of social networks, which is to get likes and see how many you have, to see who liked you. That makes you come back to the app. And to get comments, 
which gives you this reinforcement loop and lets you drive followers, and you don't have the video game high score of follower count. Correct. So then how does it grow? Because you've sacrificed something very significant in the playbook of growth. Yeah. How has it grown? Um, and do you have, do you regret making that decision and, and growing slower or are you growing just as fast? Because there must be pressure. You have venture capitalists investing to grow and those are the easiest ways to grow. Yeah. So you we took all- out the, e- you never put in the easiest ways to grow. I, I think the most organic and healthy way to grow is by word of mouth and someone finding value in it. And I think uh-huh. if you, from a, um, been a longtime listener and one of my favorite guests that you had on the show was Chip Conley. Yes. And Chip Conley's book, Peak, mm-hmm. has this concept of kind of the top of the pyramid, self-actualization, like finding yourself, doing something about finding your voice and who you are yeah. as a person creates this evangelist for your product. And right. so, you know, almost all of Visco's growth is organic. It's someone has this experience with the app, with the community, mm. and this sense of what it means for them, and they share that with others. So we architected it in a way that it would be built for you and have long-term success of making you feel good and finding your voice versus these short-term uh, kind of gains. So it's marathon running, not sprinting. Yeah, and I think it is. With that though, we also like, we did build f- feedback loops into the app. So there are ways to message, but it's only if you have a mutual if you mutually follow each other. Ah. Um, so you can start a one-to-one chat with somebody yep. if you like their art. And they like yours, t- So and if they follow you too. So you both have to follow each other. Right, um, like you, Tinder. Yeah, the, you can the, favorite someone's image. They get a notification that you favorite it, but they don't get to see how many favorites that image has. When anyone goes to look at the image, and even you as the creator look at the image, you don't see a total mm. of how many favorites are with that image. So, Got it. Let's pull up a little video here. You had a, a little sizzle reel of it. So for people who are watching, they'll get to see it in action. Um, and here, uh, we see somebody just scrolling through a feed of images. Uh, they can, of course, like them. But as you said... It's going, one, it's going directly to the creator of that image. Yeah. It's private. It's never mm. publicly displayed. Um, and then you're also given, and really where Visco started is building these professional quality tools. Um, like filters. Like filters. And we take it a lot further. Um, so now uh, we launched a membership. And so we have other video creation tools around that. Got it. Um, higher professional quality tools such as HSL. What is HSL? Hue, uh, saturation, and luminance. Got it. Yeah. So you can make it really beautiful. Yeah. And that's what I noticed is when I looked at the filters, they really helped you make very beautiful, stunning photography. Is it different than the Instagram filters? How what, how should I think about it as a potential user? Um, you know, I think there's something for everyone out there. And I think for Visco, the perspective that we've taken with our tools, it's really to help you find your voice. Mm-hmm. So we have the community that gives you a source of inspiration, mm-hmm. but that's all in service of you then going and creating yourself. And so a lot of our presets are kind of one click they get you a lot of the way there, but you can even double tap kind of into that preset to have finer tuned controls if that's what you want to like really hone and find your style. Okay. How, what is the scale of this app? How many people have downloaded it? Yeah. I know you've been featured many times by Apple now. Yeah. So right now we're a little north of 20 million weekly active users. 20 million weekly active users. Yes. Which means every month the number would be higher. Much higher. Yep. Yeah. It'd be double probably. Because you have some amount of casual users, but 20 million a week, those are people who and that, are. And that's what we really focus users. on because yeah. a week, an app that you're using on a weekly basis is not just a tool, mm. um, but it's also not the, we're, we're not looking for that utility of messaging where this is what you need to use on a daily basis to communicate with someone. We actually want, oh. we don't measure time spent in app because mm. our business model is not an ad model. Uh, right. We're not about selling ads or selling data about selling you a subscription and an experience that you're willing to pay for. And Got so it. for us, a lot of that, everything that we do is in service of creating. So are you getting out and making something? So we see a lot of patterns of finding inspiration, capturing and creating, and then maybe on the weekend or at some point with downtime, um, actually going in and editing and telling a story with the work you've created. Interesting. And uh, when we get back from this quick break, you have gotten a large number of these 20 million weekly users to actually pay you for the product. Yes. Which is something we're told by the Facebook industrial complex (laughs) that is destroying democracy and people's mental health. 
I said it, not you. The Facebook industrial cons complex, uh, the least American patriotic company in the world, including companies in North Korea as well on that, they have said explicitly, people will not pay for social networking. There's no appetite for that. When we get back from this break, I want to know how many people are paying you for the app and how you convince them to do it on This Week in Startups. Hey, everybody. I'm here with my friend Jason Maynard, who works at NetSuite. Tell everybody, what do you do, Jason? You know, I do, I do many things here at NetSuite, but I run the field operations for the business unit. And field operations means what? In this Sales, context? marketing, business development, all the stuff in terms of how we acquire customers, take care of them service them, make sure they're happy. What are the other tips for scaling your company? As people go from that 10, 20 person company to the 100, 200 person, what are some tips you can share with how to scale? So I'll give you a story. When I got to NetSuite, I came from Wall Street and I had all of these brilliant ideas and they were just sheer genius ideas. And then after 90 days, I realized I knew nothing. They were all wrong. Yeah. I had all these expansion plans. You should do this. We should do that. And one of the things I realized is that you've got to stay focused as a company. Yeah. And too often than not, I think founders lose interest in their core mission faster than their customers do. So I think it's so staying. that's such a great way to say it. They lose focus faster than their customers. The customers want more. Yes. And the founders are like, okay, I did that already. I'm going to go on to my next thing. It's it's always sort of, I got to find the next adjacency, the next this or that. Shiny new object. Shiny syndrome. new object syndrome is going to kill a company. So even, even a company like our size, mm. we have to say no more often than we say yes. Right. And you could say, well, you're mature. No, we're, we're less than 5% penetrated globally for the ERP market. Right. We need to stay focused. Right. And, and I think for when you're in those early stages, it's so easy to think about this extension or that extension and just putting all your wood behind the main thing. All right, right now, NetSuite is offering you valuable insights with a free guide, the seven key strategies to grow your profits. So go to netsuite.com slash twist, netsuite.com slash twist, and get that free guide, seven key strategies to grow your profits. We appreciate the work you're doing in the startup community. It's great Thanks, stuff. Thanks, pal. Thanks. All right, we'll be back with more. All right, our guest today is Joel Flory. He is uh, the CEO and founder of Visco, which he started... 2011? 2011, yes. So it's been another overnight success, a decade <laughs> in the making. Yes. Uh, but of those 20 million people, a significant number have uh, elected to pay you money for a social network, yeah. which we're told was not possible. And you started charging, what, two years ago? Uh, beginning of 2017. Okay, so but, we're going on three. Yeah, we've always had something to pay for in the app. Mm. It started as a paid app. Then it was a free app with in-app purchases. And then in 2017, we launched a subscription. Oh, the best. Subscriptions are the best. It's $20 a year. What? Uh, one price, global. Um, and Buck 50 a month? A little more, but yeah. Close. My goodness. Yeah. Um, Cheap. Uh, and with that, in end of 2018, we reached north of 2 million paid subscribers. What? And we're on pace. We'll double that in the coming quarter, coming quarters. So, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on. Stop the clock. We got to take a pause here for a second <laughs> and let this sink in. There are 20 p million people using the app every week. Yes. You have built up a subscription base of over 2 million. Correct. So, 10% of the people in your social app that use it every week are paying. Yes. It's and it's amazing. And the, here's the real kicker: over fifty-five percent of them are under the age of twenty-five. So, so young people with no discretionary money, theoretically, yeah. that's not true, but uh, are now paying you. So, if we were to look at something like Facebook or Instagram, with I think collectively close closing closing in on two billion users, maybe it's one point five now. Somebody can fact check me with, with what they each had last month. But they have 10%, that would be, they could have 200 million people paying them. Yet, they go in front of Congress, they go in front of, you know, um, the legal, um, you know, entities around the world, whether it's in England or here in America, and claim that people are not willing to pay for this. And the only way you could possibly make a living is by selling people's data. Do you sell people's data? We don't. Do no. you even have data on people? Do you know? What do you know about people? 
What, what we know is we know what they're creating. So as they're sharing images to the platform, we are understanding the context of that image, um, the, the quality of it. Um, but all of that is in service then, um, as you saw in the demo on the app, there's a discover section where you can see content based upon what you've created or what you've engaged with that you might also like. So even what we're using that for is to help surface other content on the platform, other creators on the platform that you might find inspiration for. Amazing. And what is the, why is it so cheap? How did you come up with $20? I mean, Netflix is what, 12, 14 a month. And people probably are getting similar value. Did you consider trying twenty a month or a hundred a year? Uh, we've considered a lot of things, and we'll still continue to explore them. Um, what we found, though, is so over eighty percent of Visco users are outside the U.S., oh, and okay. over sixty percent of those subscribers are outside of the U.S. Huh. So, as we're extremely global um, with a smaller company, we're now at one hundred and fifty employees here in Oakland, California. Uh, in the Bay Area, um, we went with what was you know the most approachable price that we could do from a global perspective, um, and we'll continue to to. Can't you there. charge different prices around the world? You could charge a subscription price we in can. yeah you know but India or China that would be different than here. Yeah, for for focus and for getting this off the ground, ah. um, that's where we started. So so you're making forty million dollars a year from subscriptions. I'm not perfect at math, but two times twenty is forty. That that was uh, that was what you were doing. Yeah, and and end of uh, 2018. Yeah, and so now you're doing much more. So the business, if you have 150 people, uh, you're basically wildly profitable already. We, we or break are, even, or could be profitable. Yeah, basically. we're we're investing heavily, um, ah. uh, both from so that growth of 150 employees, um, it's 50 percent year-over-year uh, growth in headcount. Um, and you're spending money on marketing to get subscribers? Well, we just started. Uh, um, uh, it's less than 5% of all of our subscribers are coming um, from a paid standpoint, all it's organic. It's a wonderful thing to have a subscription because you now have a lifetime subscription method. You could have two, if people do two or three years mm -hmm. on average, let's say, you know you're going to make $50 or something like that. You could acquire customers for fifty dollars and be at break even, and if they tell their friends, which they will, you can make it on that subscriber. Is that how you think about it? Is it's icing on the cake to the organic growth? It is. We love to think about it as this experience, a sense of belonging and being a part of something that is around your identity. If you want to know who I am, check out my Visco, uh, um, a safe space to be who you are. And with that, we can continue to grow with our consumers. We can continue to provide more value, more mm -hmm. opportunity. Um, so I mentioned earlier video, it's a big area of investment for us. So uh, we'll be launching in the coming months a lot of new features around video. We already have some, but we'll really- You don't have deep. stories, that format yet. No, we don't. So you could yeah. theoretically add stories and this thing could go supernova. Well, what we like to think about is, again, back of that, like not either or, like how are you creating content? Because we're also really big on helping you share elsewhere. So Visco's really large on TikTok. Uh, the hashtag ah. Visco has over 4 billion views. Interesting. Um, we're the number one and number two branded hashtag in the world on Instagram, combined over 400 million. People use this as a tool to make better content to use on other social networks, and you're fine with that. That is part of your goal, to let them export it. You're not mm. thinking like Zuckerberg of like, lock everybody in. No, so it goes back to that kind of playbook or that um, social operating system. You know what you want to use for different uh, pr uh different purposes. And so for, for Visco, it's really about that sense of investing in yourself, mm. uh, creativity. And as we talk to our consumers, so much of, uh, as you mentioned, social media has this negative impact on mental health. Uh, right. In the survey that I mentioned earlier, 97% of those surveyed uh, talked about how social media had a negative impact on their mental health. Of course. Um, over 80% of them talked about how creativity has a positive impact on their mental health. And so for Visco, this is this space where they can invest in who they are. They're mm -hmm. carving out time in their day for creativity, um, and Visco is that place for them. Now, what they create, they're expressive. They do have these needs to share elsewhere, and so we help do that. So we've launched partnerships with Snapchat to help make easier to share to Snap, um, and we're uh, working on more there. Um, and so... 
it's something we're excited about. So you'll have to have stories or some tools around that because that's become like a format now in and of itself. Well, we already have the ability to help you share directly into the story format on other platforms. We'll help you do more creative expression around that on Visco itself. And what is a Visco girl? Because that went viral at some point on Reddit or somewhere. TikTok. TikTok, TikTok, YouTube. Visco girls. Yeah. What is a Visco girl? It's just a stylish girl. It's a girl who likes to play with the filters. What is it? Yeah, so- Oh, here we well, go. Becoming a Visco girl. Well, oh my God, it's a whole thing. Oh, this is beyond a whole thing. And so I think at Visco, and especially from our consumers, we don't uh, love to put labels uh, on people. Like, So this is something that's out of your control now. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is a trend that we s- we've seen on Visco for a long time, probably since 2015. Oh, there, know your meme. Um, this, know your meme's good. I like that Yeah. Song. There, there's a there's a component with this where on Visco it's a safe space to be who you are. You're not doing this for others. You're doing this for yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a trend and kind of a characteristic around this this trend and meme that is a sense of like I don't care what you think about me. I am ah, who I am. Got it. And so from that aspect, it's no coincidence that this was born kind of within our community. Although a Visco girl is not what it, it means to be a girl on Visco. It got is it. just a small snippet. And if got you were to jump onto the app and kind of type in Visco Girl and look through search, you'll see that diverse community Got that's it. representative of so many different walks of life. Is What percentage of the users are women? Is this like Pinterest where it skews heavily? So we're not collecting uh, ah. data around that. You don't um, care anyway. Because we don't need to sell it. Yeah. Um, so for us, uh, I mean, you can see from the content that um, uh, young women... Uh, because it's predominantly under the age of 25 is really, you'll, you'll see this uh, taken in, into the platform. So. What do you think about commerce combined with social networks? It seems like Instagram's clear path and obviously House and Pinterest have sort of led the way on this. An object that's beautiful that could be purchased as well or a beautiful object in a beautiful image that could be purchased. We, we buy things visually in many cases. Yeah. We see something gorgeous and we see somebody who we're friends with, you know, champion something, the influencer marketing space, which I believe, although it's maybe derogatory in some cases where people speak about influencers in a derogatory way, I see them as experts and curators. There seems to be a positive spin to it. Have you considered allowing people to link to other opportunities to buy stuff and then you can get an affiliate or... Would you allow some great brand or do brands even participate now? Would you consider letting them link out to their commerce pages or just do the commerce in the app? So, I mean, you can have a link in your profile, but that's not what you would use Visco for. So I'd actually look at those creators, those influencers. They are still using Visco to create their content. Mm -hmm. Um, And back to that like playbook, they have the platform that's going to be focused on commerce. And so for us, that's not what we're focused on. We're focused on building a community and an experience that someone's willing to pay for, for a sense of belonging and being a part of. So we're hyper-focused on uh, creative expression um, and really creativity as a global language. So, But you can't put a link on the photo itself. No. And is that intentional? Um, we, again- that's like, always been a thing for me with Instagram. I'm like, why can't yeah. I just link to what I'm talking about here? It's like yeah. so hard to- Again- Click on link and profile. Again, the the links and, and the content within an image is less about broadcasting that out. So for others seeing it, and it's more about you being expressive and creating and finding inspiration. So uh-huh. yeah. it feels more like a magazine almost or a portfolio. Was that the intention? There's a bit of that. I think yeah. there was a an early concept that we were thinking about was around a museum, a sense um, when you walk into a museum, you don't see the artist's net worth. You don't see how many There's not a ticket counter that shows you how many people have seen this painting or this Mm. piece of art. And there's definitely not a place for people to put like heart stickers on something to say they love it. Um, It's more about an experience that you have. Does it make you feel something? Does it inspire you to go do something and create? Um, And really the lens of like the whole purpose of our community is it allows you to see the world through that artist's eyes. And it was something that my mom, she immigrated to the States when she was young. She was always telling my sister and I, like, you have to see the world through other people's eyes. Um, right. You walk a mile in other people's shoes and have a little empathy. Exactly. Understand and so that. the whole vision around Visco is to create a world in which differences are celebrated. And in order to do that, we have to have a community where you can share how you see the world, where you're safe to be who you are. All right. When we get back, I want to know how you police uh, the community, because obviously whenever you hit some level of scale, bad actors show up. 
anonymity and the internet has a sort of baked in anonymity to it. People could be sharing photos that are offensive, that could have racism or hate speech or be trolling people. But you seem to have very little of that. I want to understand how you're managing 20 million people and how uh, a week and how you think you can scale that to managing 200 million. And maybe we can even talk a little bit about what Facebook is doing and Twitter is doing in that regard as well when we get back on this week's story. You probably got a remote team like me, and you're probably tired of all these AV problems, bad sound, bad video, and just having dull meetings that don't get anything done. Well, I've got the solution for you. It's called the Meeting Owl Pro. And you can see here I have the Meeting Owl uh, right on the desk, but the new Pro is out, and it's a 360-degree video conferencing camera, and it's revolutionizing how companies meet and collaborate with crystal clear sound and video. And the way this works is it uses AI to figure out who's speaking around the table and zoom in on them, both the microphone and the camera. So the people who are at home working, or let's say they're on the road in a hotel room, they get almost like you have a director switching, go, saying, go to camera one, now switch to this camera, now switch to this microphone. And this makes it feel like you're all in the same room. And it is plug and play simplicity. You can use it with any video conferencing software. It plugs in just like any other webcam plug it into USB, boom, it just works. And over 22,000 companies are now using the Meeting Owl because it makes hybrid and remote teams that much more efficient. And it's made our Monday morning and our Wednesday afternoon meetings seamless and efficient. We cannot wait to upgrade to the Meeting Owl Pro, which now has 1080p. Uh, I mean, it's getting ridiculous. It's so good, this product, uh, that it's a real game changer. Okay, so here is your call to action. You can get $50 off your first meeting, Al, by visiting owlabs.com slash twist. Al, O-W-L, labs.com slash twist. That's owlabs.com slash twist. And use the offer code twist for $50 off your first meeting, Al. Thanks again to the team. Uh, we love the product and we use it every week, multiple times a week, and it's just... It's bulletproof. I love it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, over 20 million people are using Visco. Uh, if you're not, I need you to pause the podcast. Go do that swipe up. Go to the App Store. Type in VSCO. Download it. Uh, it's going to be 20 bucks a year. They're going to hit you up with that. I want you to pay it immediately uh, because <laughs> we want to support independent social networks and independent founders to succeed. If you're listening to this podcast, you got 20 bucks. You've been listening to the podcast for a while, huh? Since 2013. Wow. Yeah. It was one of the first, I was a non-technical co-founder, had been a photographer with my wife for a decade before starting Where? Visco. Mainly Bay Area. Oh, wow. So, yeah. Wow. So but you're we listening are... to it and everybody's telling you you're non-technical so you can't start a company. But they, they said like, and it kind of going back to like what I've loved over the years is I get to see the perspective of so many other founders. Wow. Um, also the, with the news round table, the perspective of the media of like the interpretation of what's going on in yeah. the industry. Um, so I've always really been fond of that. Yeah. Um, any other favorite guests you've seen on the pod or people whose like lessons you actually took? Um, so I mentioned chip, um, that, that was a really, he was a very influential guest. It's so um, mind blowing for people that people, to me, like hearing that you've been listening to the podcast since 2013 and you said you've watched a lot of episodes. Yeah. It's always mind blowing to me that people listen to this. Oh, it's, I mean, it, it, for me, it was like a, a lens into a world that I didn't have experience in wow. and I didn't have a network Aww. with. So it was definitely, and I also, like, I also then listened to the books that guests recommend. And so uh, read about a book a week through Audible. Wow. I mean, it's um, very touching for me. Thank you for saying that yeah. because, you know, you you do this. We're about to hit a thousand episodes next week, which is so weird. You can come to the thousandth episode party. We'll like get David Sachs is it? David Sachs is hosting, yeah. yeah. Um, and it's so weird for me because I do it because I like this moment where you yeah. and I are talking. And I would have just had lunch with you previously. I would have just had coffee with you at the Battery or something or lunch at Kokari just to get to know you. And then when I heard about this podcasting thing from Dave Weiner and Adam Curry who were like grinding on it and then Ev Williams did Odeo and we're all kind of sitting around and I was like, this is a really good excuse to talk to somebody for an hour that isn't lunch. So I'm going to try this. And that was the start of the podcast was just this is more efficient than lunch because I could share my lunch conversation and immediately it started getting like 500 people would listen. And I was like, this is mind blowing. 500 people heard our conversation. And I said that to Evan Williams, you realize that when you came on to talk about Odeo before yeah. Twitter, nobody knew what it was and then 500 people now know about it. He's like, that's crazy. 
and now like two or 300,000 people. Well, what I love is like the, a lot of the guests that you've had over the years, I would not have access to meet them or talk with them mm. as easily. And it gave yeah. me a lens into their world, how they ran their business, yeah. the thoughts that they, the intention that they put into building it or the mistakes. I think often Oof. we learn the most from the mistakes of others. Yeah. Um, so not to repeat them. So yeah. What have yeah. you, what mistakes have you made in this so far nine year journey from photographer with your wife to launching a photography app? How much did the first app cost you to make? You outsourced it. Um, we we did, and then we scrapped everything that we of outsourced. Course, I could have guessed it, that. Built it in house ourselves. Of course. So you you blew a hundred thousand dollars. Blew fifty. You blew yeah. fifty. It was yeah. dog doo doo. Yeah. It was frustrating. You banged your head against the wall. It was unbelievable. Then you yes. said, "I need to get either a co-founder or hire somebody who's a pro to do this with me." Yep. And we made our first made our first few hires uh, because we actually grew this without funding. So. We Ooh, launched Bootstrap or my favorite type of founder. And well, and even bootstrapping, it wasn't that we put our own money into this. We launched a product. Uh, it's called Visco Film. It was a desktop plugin for Lightroom and Photoshop. We ah. made a quarter of a million dollars in 48 hours off of selling this, off of five tweets and a one page website. Wow. And from there, it was like, we need to drive sales of this desktop product. So we launched an app. Um, but it was that moment, it was April of 2012 of launching an app. It was a paid app, 99 cents. Right. Um, Back when apps, people forget this, apps were kind of like pet rocks or frisbees. <laughs> like they were kind of a goof. It yeah. was like, look, I got an app. It's a lighter. And you'd light the lighter by using like the volume up button. Or it was like, watch me pour my beer. And you go like this and the beer would empty into your glass. And you're like, isn't it cool? And they're like, look, I have a flashlight app. I can turn on my LED and I have a flashlight. And you buy the flashlight app for 99 yeah. cents. Calculator so apps, dumb. like all the things. Yeah. It was so dumb. But for us, it was trying to drive those sales. And, but then it almost instantly we saw this, uh, it just, things all started to happen with the iPhone 4S came out. The only thing at that point that Apple was driving sales of the new phone was over the camera at that point, right. the 4S over the 4. And we're like, we're going to take Was that this. like some special camera? that? No, it wasn't great at all. Ah. It still sucked. Yeah. Um, but it showed Apple was willing as an OEM and Apple doesn't think just in a few months, they think in yeah. years. Decades, so if their roadmap yeah. of- yeah, if their roadmap of this phone of this iteration was a better camera, that was going to continue to be how they were going to innovate. I mean, you take a look at with the latest uh, keynote over, you know, felt like over half of it yeah. was all about the camera and video. I know, it used to be battery life, storage, the processor speed. People are like, yeah, all good enough. Camera. Camera. Creativity. And this goes back to like this whole view, you know, for such a long time as a professional photographer and when we started out shooting film, it was all about, you know, creativity was only for those that were like the pros or that right. like self-identified as it. Yeah. And you had to be good at it. And it, Are you a snob complexity. about this? You still like the SLRs and you think like we've lost something by everybody using these or have we gained something? Oh, we've gained even more than something. I mean, we've gained an opportunity to equip the world um, with a creative device to capture what they're seeing around them. I mean, it's- So you're not like a purist. So some of these people with the SLRs who are kind of like, God, this photography is subpar. It's better, isn't it? The average photo taken on an iPhone 11 or Pixel 4 is better than the average SLR photo taken 20 years ago? Well, the, but I even go like, better is so like subjective. I mean, to ultimately like more people expressing who they are, sharing how they see the world is, is, the better. is, is better. Yeah. Is That's there actually an interesting way to is, look at is it? Is there a purpose for a DSLR? Absolutely. Do what I still shoot? What is the purpose with? of an SLR today? Like, what? What? When you decide I'm going to take my SLR yeah. and dust the <laughs> dust it off, yeah, and try to find it in the back of my closet. What is the circumstance under which you do that? Um, it's usually around portraits of my family. Ah, um, so is, portraits are still better. But the the phones are. I mean it. It, everything serves a purpose. You have a tool for a different job. And if I'm going to want to use something, sometimes I'll do it. I think also just the process. So when I still shoot with film, there's something about the creative process and taking time. And um, we have- So a the fact that it throttles you is yeah. more appealing because it makes you- It's You're just charming or more intentionality. Yeah, it's and there's a moment for it. Not every moment. I'm not mm -hmm. carrying you know a film camera with me right now. I'm not carrying a DSLR with me now. It's my phone. Um, so- you know I mean, there what, is. What do you miss most about film? If you had to pick the two or three things you missed most, I'm going to give you mine after. But so the thing I miss most is that there's this gap between capturing something and yes. then actually seeing what you captured. Yes, the so anticipation. Like, I mean, people will never realize. Like I traveled through uh, Europe while I was in college, and it's like 
six months in bags of film yes. that you have no idea what you captured. Right. And you get home and I took it to Walgreens and, you know, it was like, got my film back and it's like flipping through for the first time and oh. getting to relive that experience. It's now different. I now get to, you know, at any moment's notice, pull up my camera roll and flip through and see those moments um, and connect back to it. So it was so great when we used to do the magazine covers back in the day of Silicon Island Reporter. There was a pl famous place in Manhattan um, in the Flatiron District, 20th Street. I forgot the name of it, 5th and 6th Avenue or 6th. Sixth and seventh, maybe, and I would go pick up there. It was a famous place for developing film, and all the professional photographers used it. And we had those big, thin film canisters. What, what was that called? Quarter inch or something? I can't remember. That we would oh, do like the covers of photos. The cover probably photos. shooting on medium format. On medium a, format, yeah. And they would be blowing through these rolls, and they would have to be an assistant there. I always loved the photographer's assistant, <laughs> who would they would be handing their SL one SLR over. They would get another one handed to them with the film already in it. They would be labeling it, putting it in. They'd have a, a whole row of 50 of these things on the table. And then we would go pick the photos up. Yeah. And sometimes I was so excited that I would go with the photographer, uh, Frank Michelotta, and we'd go get them together. And we would just sit there in a cafe and open them up and just one by one turning them over until we saw this beautiful cover. It was just magic. And I think that magic is really what we're trying to recreate within the app. It's that mm -hmm. moment of um, so much of how we present ourselves online today has to be perfect. Mm -hmm. And people feel this pressure to be someone else or like something else. Yeah. Um, and for Visco, there's this notion of like creativity where um, the process, there's like beauty even in the things that don't turn out. And back to those moments of like looking through a contact sheet, you would look oh, through a series. Yes. You look through a series of images, and you'd be like, "Oh, that's not great," or "Oh, I love this one." Just that process of reflecting on what you've created. Um, what do you learn from that? How are you going to do something different the next time? Yeah. Um, we're trying to bring those moments back through the right. app and make it more accessible for everyone. Now, what about racism, trolling, and all this nonsense? It's supposedly impossible to manage these communities. Is it impossible? Do you have a trolling problem? How many of the 150 people on staff, how many have to take care of people sharing porn or things that are inappropriate or hate speech? Yeah, so our community's never been about broadcasting a message to as many people as possible. So if you think about traditionally from a bad actor standpoint, it's usually to have that those behaviors seen by as many people as possible. Um, Visco's community is again has always been about how you see the world, mm. uh, been about yourself and creativity, um, and our community guidelines are are strict isn't the right word, but they're Clear. very intentional ah, actually, intentional. and they're intentional to create an environment back to our vision, a world in which differences are celebrated. You have to be safe to share how you see the world, yeah. and that cannot inflict upon someone yeah. else. And so Visco is not a place for hate. It's not a place for uh, speaking down or trolling on someone. And there's just, there's never been about that. Mm -hmm. Our community helps with that. Yeah. Um, so it's a very active community. And So you don't need to have a hundred people on this issue. You know, it's not our, it, it doesn't have to be what everyone focuses on because it's not an epidemic. Do but, you, if I follow a hundred people in my feed, is it ranked algorithmically or is it ranked chronologically? Chronologically, so. So you must have this internal debate every two weeks where somebody says, well, why don't we show the most interesting stuff first? And you say what to them? So we have both the feed in which you see a chronological order of-, uh -huh. of That's the default? Which, um, it, act, the defaults to your studio, but it actually oh. then remembers where you left off last. So if you were consuming in the feed, and you reopen the app, it'll bring you back to the feed. Got it. Um, but we're always trying to learn what people want in that. So it's, you know. So you would consider making it algorithmic? Well, no. So what I was going to say is the second section, so it starts with the feed, then there's the discover section. The ah. discover section really is our algorithmic way. Right. Um, but algorithmic for you. So it starts with a section called just for you. And this is mm -hmm. content based upon what you've engaged with on the platform, other uh -huh. content recommended to you. Mm -hmm. And then we have a series of our teams creates editorial work based upon the content on the platform, telling an even richer story of the creators on the platform. So you say so you'll see that. you trust your team more than you trust the algorithm. You'd well, rather we also have algorithms. So if you continue down into that, then we have levels of curation based upon models that we've built around different styles, around fashion and wanderlust. And, um, and you can explore in there different styles in which 
our trained models um, are curating content from the from the community. But it's not like I'm going to open a hundred accounts in Manila and pay somebody getting paid one dollar an hour to create all these spam accounts like them and, and then trend. No, because you can't there is, do that because there is no. But in that, that would all be in service of selling something. Right. If you were trying to sell eyeballs for an yeah. ad around that or engagement. So there's of no a incentive. You've taken no incentive the incentive to... out. Yeah. We... And incentives matter. But I again, I, there's a nuance there, but we architected it from the beginning not to have those incentives. Right. It's not like we saw everything around us and it was that we wanted to create a safe space where people could be who they are that was fostering creativity. Um, take an example of one of our friends. You know, he was like, oh man, I love your landscape photos. And he's like, I hate them. And I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, but they're the only thing that gets likes on uh, on Instagram right now. And so that's what I'm creating. And it's like, but he's like, I really want to be creating portraits, but that's just not what people are engaging with. It's so weird how fragile and um, weak we are as humans to this being liked. And the fact that they use the word liked like we want to be liked, we want to be understood. It is like a basic part. And then the really tragic part is they use that like. So if you don't get likes, by default you are unliked. And so sometimes even myself, I'll post something to Twitter and I'll be sitting there with my wife in bed and I'm like, God, I thought that was gonna get more likes. Hmm. And I'm then I catch myself and I'm like, who cares? Yeah. Like I did that tweet for myself. Like that's I think that's an interesting tweet. Uh, why? Who cares what it's like or not? So, so that's the exact mindset of what we're building for. And I think, you know, all of the other platforms do serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. the, you know, we have an unprecedented ability to make an impact on a global scale today because of these networks, both for good and for bad. Um, and for Visco, that investment in yourself, making it for how you feel um, was really what we wanted to, to build and, and do that from the beginning. I want to ask you a question about great art in the world. And uh, you can answer when we get back from this last break and we go around the third base. As you know, that's when the hard questions start and the interesting stuff starts. So uh, we'll come around third. Do you think great art is created by people who care deeply about the audience or people, truly great art is created by people who do not care about the audience when we get back on This Week in Star Wars? Okay, when Brex founders Henrique and Pedro came to the U.S. from Brazil, they were working on a virtual reality startup, and they were rejected over and over again for a corporate card because they had no credit history. And so they pivoted that business from virtual reality to financial reality with the Brex card, the corporate card that all the startups you know are using and rave about. It's a card specifically designed for startups, and here is why thousands and thousands of founders are using Brex. Number one, it doesn't require a personal guarantee, so you're not on the hook, founders, and you don't have your credit score or your assets at risk. They underwrite your startup, not you as the founder. So card limits are up to 20 times higher than traditional corporate cards. That makes total sense. And they eliminate the hassle of tracking receipts with their automatic receipt matching tool. So when you got everybody on different cards and they're spending a bunch of different stuff and you gotta reconcile that, that's time, time equals money. They got the software to do that and you get huge, ridiculous rewards, like seven times the points on Uber. And you get four times the amount on travel, three times on restaurants, my favorite, maybe a little Peking duck, yum yum. And two times on reoccurring software. They know what you're buying. They know you're buying that Uber. They know you're traveling, getting that Peking duck. So here is your call to action, everybody. If you're a venture back startup based in the US of A, Brex was built just for you. Sign up at Brex, B-R-E-X dot com slash twist and get card fees waived for life. What? For life? What a deal. That's B-R-E-X dot com slash twist and use the promo code twist at sign up. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, welcome back. Joel Flory is here from The Surging Visco. You've raised a ton of money now. You bootstrapped it, and then you did a $50 million Series B back in April of 2015. And the first round was a $40 million Series A led by Excel in April of 2014. That's bonkers. Yeah, so wow. So you, you that was during the, the really hot mobile and social media era. And you haven't had to raise since? We have not had to raise since. But I know that people have offered to buy the company. You have declined. Why? You know, we're, we're really 
excited by what we've built and we're even more excited about the future in front of us. And so those areas of investment that I was talking about around video, around this global opportunity mm. um, and a growing user base, uh, it's really exciting times for us. So a billion dollars is not interesting to you? You know, the I think- The mission's more interesting than a billion dollars is the, what you're saying. The, the, the mission and vision. So for us, it's always been about how can we accelerate and reach as many people as possible um, around helping everybody fall in love with their own creativity. So that is what we're focused on. Yeah. So you literally love the mission and the vision more than a billion dollars. I respect that. I think it's the right decision, by the way. If you can get to 2 million paying subscribers, guess what? You're not going anywhere. And so many people, Instagram being the primary example, sold too soon. Instagram should have never sold. It was the biggest mistake in history. Instagram will undoubtedly become bigger than Facebook. And they sold it for one 500th the value of Facebook. It was a terrible decision, yeah. especially in today's market. You know, YouTube had no choice but to sell for 1.6 billion because back then, no investors wanted to take ginormous risks funding, you know, a lawsuit or just not taking the quick, easy money. 1.6 billion back then was like, okay, why would we even try? But now it's like, well, because it's sustainable and it's important. You can take a long view of these things. Let's talk about that art. Best art created by artists who don't care about the audience or artists who are obsessed with the audience. What, what do you think? It's a big debate it's, in art. It's and artists I, that are doing it for themselves, that are expressing, okay. is kind of comes back to the whole reason why Visco exists, for you to express how you see the world. Correct answer. It's yeah. the correct answer. Because almost universally, artists are fully appreciated when they're gone. When you think about it, it's like, when, when an artist dies uh, or an artist is out of their prime, people start going, wait a second, I, I'm, the audience catches up eventually. Hmm. And the audience goes, wait a second, that's actually extraordinary. I didn't hmm. get it at the start. When you look at Bob Dylan's work in the 70s and 80s, early 80s, late 70s, people were like, what, what are these albums? I don't understand them, they're weird. And then now people are like, yeah, Blood on the Tracks, Infidels, Empire Burlesque, this whole slow train coming, all these albums now people are like wait a second these were brilliant masterpieces we weren't paying attention and it keeps happening with art like the wire was not appreciated in its time it was appreciated after the series ended i think same with the rest of development Arrested development right they had to cancel <laughs> it for people to appreciate it they're like yeah. you don't know what it's got till it's yeah. till it's gone I, um and i think i think for for a creative and for everyone my my like comment to them would be is you're worth it you're worth spending the time to make something uh, to create, not because of what others will think about it, um, not how it will compare to anyone else or anything else, but because you're worth spending that time and in investing in yourself. What do you think about the collapse of the photography industry in terms of a way to make a living because of the increasing you know, quality of the amateurs? The, it used to be if you had a magazine or a newspaper, you had a staff of photographers. You were part of this group. You were trained during this period, right? You, yes. You worked as a professional photographer in the 90s or 2000s? Uh, from 2002 to 2012. And that was the end of the line for photographers. It started to come apart. People couldn't get full-time jobs in photography anymore. The rates went from thousands of dollars a day to hundreds. Is that a loss? Or is it worth the loss for what we've gained? Because now newspapers and magazines have no problems telling their journalists uh, when you do the interview, just take a couple of pictures and we'll put one of them in the magazine or newspaper. They don't even send a photographer anymore. You know, I think as with everything over time, it evolves. Mm -hmm. And with any business and any even creative, you're needing to figure out um, how to engage in the times and with the, mm -hmm. with the medium of choice that people are consuming and creating. So I think um, while it may seem like there's a reduction. There's actually probably a greater increase of opportunities for people to be paid for their work, whether or not it's a full-time staff job at a certain, but the opportunity for them to be, as you mentioned earlier, either from an influencer yeah. or to be paid to create, um, there's a greater need for content than ever before. Right, so it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, it used to be the photographers used to keep all their secrets to themselves. They would never share how they did things. And now the internet made every you know, tutorial available to everybody. 50 different tutorials on the same topic are created. Anytime a new lens technique or flare technique or filter technique or any technique is discovered, 
it is unpacked and deconstructed a hundred different ways. And that's good for art. It, it is. This is actually the biggest turning point in my business as a photographer was when my style and aesthetic and what my wife and I created was not about the tools we used. It was about our perspective. Uh, and I What think, was that, by the way? Well, that, that perspective really was just like how we saw people and how we engaged with people instead of like the editing style of an image. And so even for Visco, it's not about being known for the preset you use or even the aesthetic of the photo. It's that we're equipping you with the means to like tell your story uh -huh. in your unique way. And so I think for like every creative out there that we all have a story to tell, it's mm -hmm. all worth telling. Um, and how can we come alongside you to equip you with the tools and inspiration to do that? What about groups and multiplayer mode? Do you think about that a lot? Because it feels like social is also having a bit of a renaissance with groups and people maybe creating sub communities within apps. Have you thought about that? Uh, we think about it a lot. We see it a lot already on Visco. With Be tags? With tags and people coming together. So great example, um, a young man by the name of Rico, uh, who lives in Oakland, and we were chatting with him, and he's like, oh, yeah, I you know, really wasn't into like photography or anything, was reading um, an editorial piece by your team on street photography. I got inspired. And I was like, I can do that. And so went out and started capturing photos in Oakland, through Visco, found other photographers in Oakland that were creating photos. And now they get together almost on a weekly basis during a lunch break or something to go out and do street photography together. They've created a sense of community and belonging. And so for us, a large part of the future is not a subscription of features, mm. but a membership experience, a sense of belonging and being a part yeah. of something. And so the community plays a big part of that. And we see this both in the app, but also offline. So we have a free studio in our office for people to come in and create. Really? We have a gallery. We're hosting events and we're always looking for ways to do that at a greater scale. I was going to ask you about that. You you put the first HQ in Oakland, the second's in Chicago. Is it an advantage for Bay Area companies to be in Oakland? Because I think three of my 12 people commute from the, the Bay or four. Yeah. It seems like it might be an advantage to be over there. Is it? Um. Well, I think Oakland is a huge advantage. I love the people of Oakland uh, and the community. Vibrant, yeah. um, it's like San Francisco used to be. Well, I mean, I've grown, I'm born and raised in uh, San Leandro, which is just south of Oakland, and then also Oakland. Um, and so for me, from like the perfect place in the world is a Friday night at the Oakland Museum of California. It's gathering of food, music, art, and community, and everyone from around the world's coming together um, to celebrate. And so for Wait, me- what is this? The Oakland? Oakland Museum of California, OMCA. Okay. Um, have- a, uh, They do a, this every Friday? Every Friday night. Friday nights- Food a, trucks, food, whatever. Yep. And then there's um, music and dancing, instruction. There's art programs. I don't even know about Half this. price admission to the museum. Wow. It's, it is literally, you know- I never understood this about museums. They're open during the day, but not at night. Everybody's working during the day. Nobody's- oh, okay. They should just flip the whole script. <laughs> It's it, it is really like you have to you have to come down like it is actually you know what I've been to this my favorite part was the cannabis uh, exhibition you have they have a whole cannabis oh at, at OMC yep I'm joking they do I just made that up they have yeah they have literally yeah. they're yeah. like here's your tacos here's your art oh here's no your not music, at the, yeah and here's weed. yeah not not as a part of the actually finance. now my understanding is they decriminalize psilocybin and ayahuasca and everything so. Oakland's going to become a real destination. You're going to have some great brainstorming sessions, <laughs> I predict, at Visco in the near future. Literally, it's going to be legal. Or I, I think now it's, don't quote me on this, but they decriminalized anything that grows out of the ground. So I think magic mushrooms, psilocybin, and ayahuasca and this stuff are going to be, oh, you're not going to get arrested for it, which means the next step is it's going to be legal. So literally, people are going to be tripping in Oakland very soon, like legally tripping. This is going to be <laughs> crazy. Uh, what? Why Chicago for the second headquarters? So Chicago for a variety of reasons. Yeah. One, um, for within the U.S., it's our largest active user base of a city really? in the U.S. Um, Any idea how that happened? Is because of the Art Institute or something? Um, no, large community. Um, one kind of example, we hosted an event. We helped launch uh, the Today at uh, Apple Um their events within their apps, uh, the Apple stores. Um, we hosted a community event there. Oh, right. Um, this was a little while back. Um, we've always just had a thriving community there. 
Um, I think Chicago is also, um, you know, and, and when we look at creativity, we've talked a lot about photo, mentioned a little bit about video, but it really spans everything. I think specifically for this generation, Gen Z, um, it's not about self-identifying as a photographer or designer. You just make stuff. And so right. the art and music and fashion scene of Chicago is is really very, cool. um, very growing. It's groovy. Uh, when you look at the global marketplace, what are the top markets? And did you intentionally build those markets or did you just wake up one day and those markets were the top ones? Um, so Who's we, top? Have, we have... Uh, Paying subscribers in over 160 countries around the world. Okay, so, so it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everywhere. Um, what are the top three non-US? You know, you'll see as a region, Southeast Asia, very large. Really? Um, you'll see Europe, very large. Um, but again, it's- Europe makes sense. It's very photogenic and people yeah. are very artistic. But for Southeast Asia, you have a lot of people happen? coming online with devices for the first time. Uh, and Looking for something to do. And and really yeah. for a form of self-expression and sharing how they see the world. And so um, we're, we're just seeing that with the rise of the smartphone adoption and usage, you, you basically- it Do you have any intentionality trend. about the uh, global expansion? Are you like translating the app? Well, we, we absolutely, absolutely do now. When we started, it was, we realized how global it was. So we, were, we couldn't afford much, so we're just like, Everything was icon based. There was very little words in the ah, app because they didn't have to translate anything. Right. Um, so those are some of the things when we it's started. It's easy to translate now. Oh, it's it, there's services, yeah. right? Do you but, use a service for that? Um, or we you do it use a variety of different things, but we actually even think about it. it it's much more than just translating. It's mm -hmm. around creating original content and engaging the community in those countries, um, because ultimately, authentically. Um, you're wanting to see more from where you're at and from other creators. Um, Why not allow people to subscribe or donate like Patreon to their favorite person? Have you considered that? It we, feels like it's very in line with your mission, in fact. It, well, you asked one of the biggest mistakes or lessons learned from early on. And I think for Visco, it's always been about focus. So uh, um, both a lack of, it can be, uh, around the times in which we try to do too much. Right. Um, and then great focus, 2017, we kind of stopped a lot of different business lines and we're like, we're going to go all in on subscription. And it's working. And it's working. So for us, there's a lot of great opportunity that we can do to help accomplish our mission and vision and grow with what we already have. Um, right now, we're hyper-focused around creative expression and yeah. a community that helps drive it. Yeah, I mean, if you 10X from here, that would be extraordinary to have hundreds of millions of dollars in subscription revenue that you can count on is just incredible. I mean, it happened to us with com.com. We were the first major investors in that company. And I think we own 5% of it and nobody believed in it and nobody believed in subscriptions. And they switched from like $10 for the app one time, like you were 99 yeah. cents to subscriptions. Consumption went up. There's something magical about subscriptions. What is it? I think, we live in a day and age in particular where people are very uh, clear that if they're not paying for something, they are uh, they are the business. Like, Got it. And um, you think consumers are? I think consumers are aware. I think specifically Gen Z is, you know, this time next year, they'll be the largest purchasing generation, over $146 billion in direct purchasing wow. power. And they are making decisions based upon causes that they care about and brands that support those causes. And not just that they're throwing money at these causes, but that they authentically care and are doing something about it. And so um, we, we definitely see that people are willing to pay for something of value. That was the whole premise around Visco of building something for the consumer of value that they're willing to pay for. And what, what I love about a subscription is it's not just paying that one time, we're incentivized. So all 150 plus people now at Visco are working towards delivering an experience that you'll continue to pay for. That's interesting. I, it is causing significant um, confusion in Silicon Valley because you have the venture capital community very focused on marauding capitalists and the drive towards profitability and driving revenue. And then you have this younger generation coming up who are saying, we don't care about that, which is then leading some of the venture capitalists to go like, okay, well, we're not, not going to focus on that generation. We'll focus on the people who do care about that. But I believe, and I've always believed that they'll be ignored until they can't be ignored. So the cause-based stuff was causing people to not get funded mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. So I would tell all my founders, please don't become a B corporation. 
it's going to, you know, just scarlet letter you. People are not going to want to invest in your company because they think you're like, uh, you know, Ben and Jerry's and you're going to be some do-gooders and they do not want do-gooders. They want people who build real businesses. And you're, you're basically building the business around this tiny demographic who actually cares. But now that demographic is getting so big. In 10 years, I think it flips where they're so influential that we're going to see the biggest companies are the ones with the social mission. But I still don't think we're here yet. Well, I mean, for us, the way that we think about this, so I believe that mental health is a very pressing issue at hand. What well, If not, it should be oh one of the God, top shouldn't. discussions of everyone, especially in Silicon Valley, um, with what we've built yeah. um, and the opportunity that we have to make an impact. So for Visco, it's around the positive impact that creativity has on mental health. Now, I believe, and we're seeing this, that in particular, Gen Z is willing to pay for that. So it is, I think if you can align your mission and vision and values to a business model that scales. Like, yeah, that's threading the needle right there. But Do, but they, I, do they actually, do, are your paying customers aware of the fact that they're the product on Twitter and Facebook and they feel icky by that and feel better to pay and be part of it? Do they say that to you? They say they are aware of what is happening on those platforms and the negative impact it has on them. Really? They are, but in a mass phenomenon, they, yeah. But I think what's very interesting is that um, they're aware of it. They're actually not, I think it's a lot of maybe our generation and, and other generations that are stuck and unsure of how to navigate. I get so much hope talking um, to our community. Ah. They know how to navigate this. They're like, I'm very aware of what I'm doing on this platform and the impact it has on me. That is why. I'm counterbalancing this with investing mm. in my mental health through creativity. So they're they're aware of, wow. but they know they need to engage and they use this great tool for communication or broadcasting to as many people as possible. Um, they're finding these outlets and investing time and money in so their mental smart. health. So smart, dude. It really is interesting when you, for every, one of the great things about capitalism that I think is getting lost on the public's overall view of it and even the press is that every time capitalism goes overreaches in one direction, it becomes an opportunity for another set of founders. So if privacy is being invaded massively and people are concerned about leaks, you have something like Hacker One, a company designed to hack people's companies in a white hack kind of way. If people are concerned about their privacy, all of a sudden VPNs, which were this obscure 1% of the audience, now people are like, I use a VPN. I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, how did VPNs become mainstream? And now you see with social networks, people are literally saying, I'm deleting Facebook from my phone. I'm only using Twitter at work on my desktop when I have something that I need to communicate for business reasons. I'm not doing it all day long. I'm removing these things from my phone. And then even Apple is conceding by putting the screen time yeah. limits on it. Think about that as an opportunity for Apple, Facebook and Google being so insanely obsessed with collecting data has given Tim Cook the ability to say, your privacy is a feature of our phone. The hardware's feature is that we don't take your data, we leave it on your phone encrypted. Hmm. That's pretty amazing. Capitalism works. I mean, my hope is that all of this leads to, I love seeing that other platforms are experimenting with removing likes and comments. It's not a threat to Visco. Should Twitter? Um, I think- If you were advising Jack, would listen, you? you know Jack? I don't know Jack. Um, I'll, I'll introduce you. I, I believe, that every company should be doing what's in the best interest of the consumer. So if they are focused on delivering value and building they something should. of the consumer, they should be doing what's in the best interest of them. I would love if they got rid of the retweet. I think the retweet and the likes are killing Twitter. Just get rid of them. Who cares? Write something. Doesn't mean you can't use it for the algorithm to surface something, but we're in this like weird video game where people are obsessing over it. And I think it does create this overhang of anxiety um, and this dependency on it. When I see one of my tweets go, like I had a tweet the other day, I tweeted something where Obama was telling people to like stop, it was, it was kind of meta, he was, Obama said, listen, you know, being outraged on social media is not activism. Activism and going into the world, real world and doing change is activism. So don't give yourself any credit for retweeting something or being upset on social media. You actually got to go in the real world and do mm -hmm. something. And I tweeted that and I was like, well, when Obama 
is telling you to stop being hysterical and to start actually doing work in the world, that says something. Uh, and it went unbelievably viral. I think I maybe had 10,000 likes or something crazy. And I felt so good. Hmm. And then I realized, wait a second, why am I feeling this enormous sense of pride at a sentence of me just describing what he was saying? I was like, oh, validation. Validation is so important for humans. Well, it's, we, we look at it's it. It's dangerous. It's dangerous and it's also an opportunity. And so I think for Visco, we're always looking at three things. And as Greg, my co-founder and I, uh, in building Visco, three human truths that I am known, I belong, and I'm taken care of. I'm and known. I'm known. I've been seen. Someone right. sees me for who I am. Right. Um, who I really am. Who I really am. Yeah. yeah. I, I belong. So there's a level of acceptance and approval. So Those some form of validation. See me and and they, they see me and they accept me. And they acknowledge. Yeah. They acknowledge. And me. then there's a sense of taking care of. There's a level of helping and service, yes. hospitality. Um, uh, one of my favorite books, The Outward Mindset by the Arbinger Institute. It's the real. Outward Mindset. What is outward it Mindset. Well, exactly that. It's, it's around, for, in the workplace in particular, but in life. Understanding the needs of others and helping meet those needs is actually really beneficial for work. So if mm -hmm. I know what you're trying to accomplish because we're working towards a common goal, mm -hmm. if I can better understand what you need and how you're feeling in this in this moment and situation, how might I help you? That will help us as a team accomplish mm -hmm. our overall goal even better. So, That's great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I I try to explain to people like having a mission and values, the most important thing about doing those as a founder is for you to have clarity hmm. as to what you want to do in your life yeah. and the world in which you want to go to work every day. Because one of the things I see kill companies is the founder doesn't set a mission. A mission is suddenly thrust on the company just by the nature of its success. Um, and then the values get set by the most vocal employees. And then all of a sudden the founder is coming to work at a company where they didn't set the mission and the values may be incongruous to theirs, and then they don't enjoy going to work. Yeah. That's the death of the company. If the founders are not enjoying coming to work, what's the mission that you set for the company? So we start with the vision, and so yeah. that's a world where differences are celebrated. Um, a world where differences are celebrated. Yeah. Nice. That's, you've seen, you're seeing the world through other people's eyes, so back Love to it. that. Yeah, you know, back to mom. Um, yeah. And um, Ther Did the therapist tell you about, make that connection for you, or did you make it? No, my, I mean, my- I'd love to be in that therapy session. Yeah, say, no. What did your mom say? <laughs> yeah, no, I think it's, uh, my, my mom said this, I had the impact on me, and I don't know if I truly appreciated it mm. um, for what it was until later in life. Um, and I think now being married and with kids, like you're doing that on a daily basis. You're needing to understand the needs of others in a way yep. unlike ever before, where it's not just about you. Yeah. Um, and I think- that for me has had a huge impact. That's what I love going to work. I love understanding the needs of our team and how to bring them together to to accomplish something great together. What are the values? Did you just set like some values? We are blank. We are blank. Yeah. Um, you know, our, our values are around being an active participant, not being like a passive observer, um, around being yourself, um, having a growth mindset. Yeah. Um, Personally for, and for the company. Yeah. And building together. So not... Uh, doing this on your own. No hero ball. Yeah, this is about both teaching and learning at the same time. Uh, always put in the creator first, and then if something's worth doing, it's worth doing right. See, that's the one I like. That's what Benjamin Franklin who said that, I think. Somebody, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Yeah, so I think it might have been Benjamin Franklin. Anyway, if you're going to do something, you might as well do it right. Right? Like, if you're going to put the time into making a steak, make it the best steak you can. Yeah. You know? We, we, we talk a lot about having intention. So, like, have a reason for what you're doing. Because the beauty of that is, even if it fails, mm. if you had an intention for what you were trying to do, you then know what you can do differently the next time. So that right. ties into that growth mindset and ability to like yeah. grow and find a new way. It is amazing. I have some founders who come to work and they just go to work and they just start going through a punch list. And it's like, well, what's important here? And they're like, I don't know, the list? Should I resort the list? I'm like, no, 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 no. What's the mission of this company? Like, What are we actually trying to accomplish here? And let's talk about that for a second and then set some goals around that. Yeah. And then you can prioritize. But if you don't have the mission, how do you prioritize what's important? Yeah, two book I mentioned Chip Conley and yeah. he has a book Peak that yeah. was helpful in that. Um and the, probably the largest one was Patrick Lincioni's book, The Advantage. 
The Advantage, which was yeah. his previous books, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. So that's the one that made me realize that we had a lot of issues and I needed to like be very intentional. Do an intentional. offsite meeting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was like the five. Five dysfunctions of a team. And then he did another one, like the, the additional five dysfunctions or something like exploring them. But it's about offsite meetings. Yeah. And he tells it like it's um, a fictional account. Oh, yeah. And there's like some high performer, but who's a jerk. And yeah, you so know, I highly recommend everyone to oh, read it. Yeah. Lance Yoni, we, we haven't had him on the pod. Let's get him on the pod. The table group. Yeah. The would, table group. Have you his... interacted with them or? I mean, just... they do offsites, I think. Yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, here he is. The advantage. Why organizational health trumps everything else in business. Yeah. Yeah. Lance Yoni. He's great. He's local too. Is he? In the Bay Area. Yeah. Bring him to me. Do you know him? I don't know him. Let's take him to lunch. Me and you I would we'll love take that. him to lunch. Oh, you know where Deal. we can go? Um, have you been to the uh I think it's a Mexican joint in the basement or the first floor of the K4 Center for Social Justice? Oh, um Agave. Agave. Yes. Have you been there and yeah. had the mole? It's amazing. Oh my lord. Yeah. Every time Mitch Capor is like, hey, we can have the board meeting for Blockable at my place, I'm like, yes. <laughs> and I'm like, do it in the morning. And they're like, yeah. I thought you don't like mornings. You're an afternoon guy. I'm like, I like mornings because I want to go there and get that chicken mole. And they make the tortillas and arepas and everything there yeah, like phenomenal. to order. Yeah. And then they put this. <laughs> I was never into mole source, sauce. I always thought it was kind of weird. I wasn't sure of the taste. And they do roast chicken. You know, like when you have a great roast chicken? Well, it's my favorite. It's unbelievable. Yeah. And then they shred it apart. Yeah. They pour this mole sauce on it. And then they make you fresh tortillas. And I, like literally, we got to get the hell out of here. Well, And so go there, back there and get it. It's so, The line out the door is bonkers. So you can take me there. And then I'll take you to Cosecha, Cosecha. Which, is al which is also in Oakland. Huh. Um, I and, feel like we're going to be buds. And there, I think you and I might have a bromance so, on here. So Monday, there's, a, Monday, there's a, a mole. How old uh, are your mole kids? Mole Mondays. Uh, 10 and 8. All right, I got a nine-year-old. This is perfect. She's gonna go. be ten. Yeah. We could go do something with the kids. You and yeah. I could start to like have a little yeah. thing. You've been watching. There. there we go. Oh, yeah. Cosecha. Oh. Yeah. Wait a second. Let me see that place. Have I been there? Is that it's the place? It's in Swan's Market. Ah, uh, no, I haven't been there. I went to another place over in Oakland. That's right by Berkeley. That was sorry, it. Berkeley. The, that, that was yeah. That's a that's co that's Cosecha, and then I went to this other place in Berkeley. That's unbelievable. Another like Spanish. Or Mexican hybrid place. Anyway, the food in Oakland is off the charts. See, this is exactly what happened and, in Manhattan. But it, this is the thing. Everything in Oakland is. Like, from the art, the people. I know. I kind of feel like I should move the office there, but it's just so hard to get there. But once you're there. I know, but I live but in it, Hills Bar. Or I got this, oh, like, yeah. I got, you know, from the peninsula. But from Bar, from like, it's been a huge draw. So we're just one block off See, of that's Bar. that's what I think is. I yeah. think that the future is going east. I think. Oh, um, yeah. oh yeah. There you go. I have, actually, the top left image is from Cosette. This is my Visco profile. Oh, um, there you go. Look at that. So yeah. beautiful. So that wow, is from beautiful. Cosette. Um, what is that? So that's Airbnb's lobby. Fun fact. Oh. Um, I had my high school senior prom. This was at the old gallery at the Jewelry Mart. Uh -huh, yeah. um, I had my high school prom there. And then I also bought the wedding ring for my wife there. Oh, very um, nicely done. And I had this moment where I was waiting for an Uber outside of the, out of their oh. office. And I was like, looking back at the building, I was like, Oh my gosh, I've had some big life moments here. Absolutely. All right, listen, I could talk to you for another two hours, but I got to go give a speaking gig, unfortunately. I would rather be here talking to you. I'm going to head to lunch. All right. Um, everybody, VSCO, go download it. It's going to upsell you on paying for a membership. I'm going to advise you to just pay it. Be loyal. Uh, let's get them some uh, more members. And uh, really, thank you for Visco. That's what I said, VSCO. Visco. I'm just telling them how to spell it. It's Visco like disco without the I. Does that mean something, VSCO? Uh, it did. It what stood did for it Visual Supply Company. The Visual Supply Company. Yeah. All right. It, it doesn't mean anything. It just means Visco. Yeah. That's why it's Visco. It's yeah. Visco. All right. Uh, hey, congratulations, Joe. Really nice to see a, a good guy with a good plan do something so important in the world. And um, yeah, I'll see you in Oakland. We'll see you all next time on this week's service. Bye bye. You crushed it. <laughs>